Try to keep everybody awake as best we can. Um, I'm Mark Dempsey, Rescue 2, I guess most of you all know. So 35 years up there, I'm an engineer. Uh, I guess I'll keep doing this until it gets on the farm. So it's quickly getting on the farm. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go over elevators and elevator rescue. Uh, Jamie asked me to uh, come and give a presentation to you guys. I'm going to try to keep the inside part fairly brief. Less than an hour we'll try. Then we'll take a brief break and then we'll go up the road to the garage on Amherst Avenue and actually do. I'm a firm believer that I could talk all day about this and you all would probably retain about 10%. But if we go and do it, you'll have a better chance of retaining maybe 12%. All right, so I don't know how well you all can read this. I'm going to go through a couple of incidents. Um, it's my opinion that this county takes elevator calls pretty lightly. And I'm going to give you some examples why, personally, I don't take them lightly. So, in this case, this is a, a lady in Manhattan. Elevator, she calls for an elevator. Elevator comes, doors open up. In the middle of her stepping across the threshold with two people on the elevator, the <coughs> elevator takes off. That elevator should never move with those doors open, right? Well, it did. It kills her. Not only does it kill her, the two people in the elevator are stuck. Well, it takes the fire department some hour to get her out. So they're stuck with the body dangling in the elevator. And in this case, what they found is there were workers that worked on the building and left at 9.55, and at 9.56 she was killed. They left a jumper in the system that bypassed that safety cut out on the doors. All right, next one, 84-year-old man was trapped between the floors in an elevator in Harlem. This actually was just days from that other accident in New York. Um, basically, he went to get on the elevator before the doors uh, fully closed. He did what a lot of people do. You go to the elevator, the doors are closed, and you you know, you open the doors and you go in. He's halfway in and the doors are still open and the elevator moves. Crushes him. He doesn't die, but he was, you know, critically hurt. This one, uh, this woman in New York was dragged, this was at a hospital, and um, she was getting on the elevator, elevator moves, she's dragged eight floors, finally the elevator stops. Again, they found out a maintenance guy had inadvertently disabled the safety switch. Again, that elevator should never move when those doors are open. Um, this is Long Beach, California. You know, same thing. She's riding the elevator, gets stuck between the second and third floor. She climbed out of the elevator. I guess she knew enough to get the doors open. She climbs out of the elevator. She's halfway between in and out. And what does the elevator do? It moves. This one's particularly gruesome. This doctor goes to get on the elevator, same thing. Tries to get on the elevator as the doors uh, are closing, gets stuck, the elevator moves, and it decapitates him. So the moral of the story is, when we get called for an elevator incident, that elevator has stopped for some reason. And we have no idea why. It could be something going, going on in the computer that runs the elevator. It could be that moisture is getting into the system. So you can't make the fundamental assumption that all those safety features that are there to protect the occupants and you are going to work. So my presentation is kind of built around a couple of extra steps that we take at Rescue 2, I hope, at least I take at Rescue 2, to ensure that when you do an elevator rescue, you do it safely. The last thing you want to do is be the, uh, the lead-in on the, you know, the news in the evening saying that, you know, fireman rescuing lady, you know, lady dies, news at five. All right, so there's two basic types of elevators. Anybody know what they are? Hydraulic. Hydraulic. Cable. And cable or traction. Some people say hydraulic and electric. That's not really accurate because... Um, 
a hydraulic elevator is actually runs on electricity. It just is a pump that pumps hydraulic fluid. So we have hydraulic and traction. And let's look at a hydraulic elevator real quick. Hydraulic elevators are pretty common in buildings about six stories and under. You won't find many hydraulic elevators over six stories. They were super popular for a while. They're actually going to be going away in new buildings because of a new technology I'll talk to talk about at the end. <coughs> These are probably our easiest elevators to deal with because there's a few tricks we can do to make our job easier. <coughs> Basically, you've got, a, you've got a reservoir, you've got a pump, you've got piping that goes to a piston, They're just like the Hurst Ram, no different, that, that hydraulic fluid forces the piston up or pumps the fluid back to get the piston to go down. The piston actually extends down into the ground fairly deep. One of the reasons these are, gonna, these are not very popular anymore is over the years that hydraulic fluid kind of leaks out, gets into the concrete, and then seeps into the ground, and then all of a sudden you get what will go to hazmat problem in your building. So these, these will be going away, but you know all the ones we have for now will stay. Okay, any questions on hydraulic? Yes. Uh, and I don't know if you go over this later, but is this something without going through the, the elevator rooms, you're able to determine from simply looking at the elevator? No, not necessarily. Typically, most of our buildings, if they're five stories or less, are going to be hydraulic. Most of the building, all the buildings taller than that would be trash. Okay. But it's, it's difficult to tell right off the bat. One of the key things about hydraulic is that that machine room where this pumping apparatus is, is typically at the bottom of the elevator shaft, you know, next to the shaft. But it doesn't have to be. It can be at the top or it can be anywhere in the building, but it's usually at the bottom. Our new building, we have two elevators going into the new building. The second elevator that we had to cut out of the budget, the machine room is actually on the second floor because it, it would have otherwise been like in the bunker. So there are times where that machine room is not going to be at the base, which makes that can be a little bit tricky. Okay, uh, a traction elevator is a controller, a motor, a sheave, and that's where your cables go up and down, an elevator, and counterweights. What some people really don't understand is the way this elevator is designed, all that sheave and motor is doing is moving those cables. It's actually balanced so that if you were to take the brakes off of the sheave, the, uh, the car would actually rise. So the counterweights are set up to be heavier than the car. So when the car is loaded, the motor is really not doing very much work. It's just moving those cables back and forth. And the way it's designed is a single cable is rated to support everything, but we have redundancy, and usually you'll see four, five, or six cables, so you have that degree of um, safety built into it. Now, I know a few people were around when this happened. 12630 Veers Mill Road, 1979, right? Wasn't it? 76, 78, 78, 79. I had just come on, Young Buck. Um, they run a fire, 12, 630. We had had an arsonist lighting some stuff off. Um, snorkel 18 runs the call. Dave Flowers, he was on the snorkel. They go up, he gets together with somebody. They go up, you know, they get a pretty good fire on the top floor. They go down the hallway with a hose line. All of a sudden, Dave Flowers disappears. What happened in that case was they actually went into the elevator shaft. They thought they were, he probably thought he was going into an apartment because they were falling in the heat and smoke. The arsonist had piled the elevator with shit on the lower floor, poured some gas in there, lit it off, sent the car to the top floor. The car went to the top floor, the doors opened, the heat of the fire fused the doors in the open position, and after a little bit of time, the fire gap to the cables, the cables fell, fell and the elevator fell to the bottom. Dave went to the shaft and fell to the bottom also. Somehow he survived and imagine the pucker factor if you're the crew that sent to find him, 
get him and get him out. They had to know how to get into that elevator fast. And they did, and they got him out, and like, kind of a miracle that he survived. So things do fail, is the point. So we have a we have a traction sheave, we have cables that go to counterweights, um, we have a controller I talked about. This is the motor, this is the sheave, these are the cables. Again, this one looks like it has one, two, three, four cables. So a good bit of redundancy and safety. This is the brake right here, that when the motor stops, the brakes you know, hold the car in place. This right here is the speed governor. If it goes too fast, these little uh, counterweights kick out and kick a switch and the elevator will stop. All right, so res rescue is basically the same principles for both types of elevators with a few details thrown in that I'll go over. First, we gotta locate the car. Next, we gotta verify that somebody's in it. And we need to see if they're in distress because that might change our decision making. We need to isolate the power. This is key. To me, this is key. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We need to determine our best approach to get into the elevator. We need to affect the rescue. And then before we leave, we need to secure the car. Last thing you want to do is get somebody out of the elevator that's stuck, turn the power back on and leave. The elevator starts working again, and then you come back in an hour and somebody else is stuck. All right, so to locate the elevator, the, the easiest way is to go to the lobby and there's an enunciator that typically will tell you where the car is. Now, if the power's out, that enunciator's not going to work, so that's not going to help you. But if the power's on and it's one car out of a bank of three that stopped, then you uh, go and you check the lobby enunciator and it should tell you where the car is. In this day and age, things are much easier for us because almost everybody is ca carrying a cell phone. So we get a lot more information than we ever did before. Um, so we can check the call, you know, the printout. The printout should have some caller information. It might even have the person's cell phone on there. I've been trying to bring my cell phone almost everywhere I go because lately, like the metro incidents, the last metro incident that I ran, the cell phone wound up being the most reliable form of communication, which is pretty sad. So I've been trying to carry my cell phone with me on every call I go on, just for incidents like that. And finally, you can look in the shaft. We'll go over how to get into the shaft in a minute. But you can look in the shaft in a, you know, a tall building, and you can get an idea, OK, are we up five floors, 10 floors? Then you can go up and kind of narrow down where it is. Any questions about finding the elevator? <coughs> 